And for more on the state of vaccination in the U.S., let's bring an infectious disease specialist and ABC News medical contributor, Dr. Todd Ellerin. Dr. Ellerin, good morning. You know, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine appears to prevent the spread of COVID from person to person. Now, that was a big question that we'd been waiting on. So does this offer any more confidence that other vaccines might do the same? Good morning, Diane. This really offers more hope, and that's what we're looking for. Just like Witt said, it looks like the AstraZeneca vaccine it may reduce transmission by about 50 to 66 percent. They did weekly nasal uh, PCR testing on, patient, on, on individuals that were in the vaccine group and the placebo group, and they saw that there really was a reduction in the patients who got um, positive tests. And so remember, if you're not shedding virus in the nose, it's unlikely you're going to transmit it to other people. So uh, I think, and I do believe that other vaccines are going to show the same thing. In fact, Moderna has already um, basically published the fact that there was about a 66% reduction in individuals who got the vaccine before dose one and two who actually had positive nasal tests. So, so we've had, we've heard glimpses of this before, and this is also very good news. So why isn't the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine approved yet in the U.S.? Right. So I think there's a couple of points we have to remember. And the most important one is that there's an ongoing phase three trial of that vaccine going on right now in the United States, and it's about to be completed. So I think after the FDA gets that data and also has the data, of course, from, from the UK and, and other countries, they're going to ultimately decide whether to give the AstraZeneca vaccine emergency use authorization. And there's also this research out of the UK on whether people can mix and match the vaccine. Scenes. How much of a game changer would it be if they find that you can? I mean, if these vaccines could be interchangeable, that would be a massive game, game changer. Why? Because we need vaccine flexibility. This is called heterologous boosting. You give one vaccine as your initial or prime dose, and then the second vaccine is a different one. And there, there is data supporting other vaccines where we've done that with success. If this is promising, then this could really change the face of, of vaccine shortages and really help with some of these major challenges. I'm really hopeful that that this study um, will be will will show a, uh, a very solid immune response, but that remains to be seen. That's going on right now in the UK. And Johnson and Johnson is expected to apply to the FDA for emergency use of its COVID vaccine this week. Uh, the company says it's 66 percent effective in trials. That's compared to Pfizer's and Moderna's 95 percent. So, should we be worried about getting a vaccine that has a lower efficacy rate? I know what you're saying, and, and what I don't want to see happen is that we think we're only going to give Pfizer and Moderna to our mothers and that we're going to give Johnson & Johnson to our mothers-in-law. That, that, that's no, I, I want you to think of it a little bit differently. I know 66% seems much less than 95%, but let's talk about prevention of severe illness. That's really the key. And when you look at the Johnson & Johnson data, severe illness was decreased by 85%. That's very close. Pfizer's was 90%, Moderna's was 100%, but these were also small numbers, so this is in range. We're in a pandemic right now, a crisis that we've never seen before. As soon as a vaccine's available, irrespective of which vaccine it is, we have to roll up our sleeves and take that. Now, there have been fears of a vaccine shortage. You touched on that just a second ago. So why can't Pfizer and Moderna work with other pharmacy companies to try to produce more of their vaccine? Right, Diane. People are saying, you know, uh, you know, Pfizer and Moderna are, are keeping their kind of vaccine development a secret, and if they could just open up to other companies, that they we would be able to get much more mRNA vaccine. That is absolutely not true. There's a very complex logistical steps that are needed to make vaccine. I'm going to tell you one of the biggest bottlenecks, taking that messenger RNA and encapsulating it around that lipid, what's called a lipid nanoparticle. Just that step in, in of itself, there's only a few places in the world that could do that. So if you called companies, different pharmaceutical companies and said, uh, we want you to be able to do this. Will you shift your you, what you're doing right now and start to make this? They'll be like, we can't do that. So the point is, is that the other pharmaceutical companies are absolutely 
helping the process. They've called other companies like Pfizer to say, we're going to help you with the finish and fill part of vaccine development. Uh, Sanofi has said they're going to get into this. So big pharma is really helping, but you can't just have other companies making messenger RNA vaccines. It, it, it's not possible right now. All right, Dr. Todd Ellerin, always great to have you on and to explain these things you to too, us. Diane. Thank you. Take care. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.